Okay, it's starting to uh, fill up a bit. So we'll get started. Um, so uh, good morning for those of you joining from uh, UK and Europe. Uh, good afternoon if there's anyone uh, joining from China. Thanks for joining us today. Um, those of you who uh, who don't know, uh, I'm David Van Shaik. I'm CMO of uh, the Marketing Practice. Uh, we are a uh, B2B agency uh, working for technology clients, and we're based uh, in the UK, in Germany, uh, and in the USA as well. Uh, we're also part of the E3 network, which is a global network of independent agencies that share best practice and insight. Uh, and mean our clients get access to local knowledge on a global scale. Um, really looking forward to the discussion today. Um, we're going to, I think, learn from two fascinatingly different business cultures about the responses to the pandemic uh, and what happens next. Um, and we're also going to sort of, I guess, gaze into our crystal ball a little bit and, and, and look into the future because we've spent the last uh, guess six, seven weeks uh, here in um, in, in lockdown and uh, kind of trying to find our feet, figure out what the hell's going on. We're just starting to get our head up, I think, and look to the horizon. And uh, I know in, in China, you've now been out of lockdown in Shanghai for, for a month at least, and everyone's back to work. So uh, I, I think, you know, it'd be fascinating to hear just what it's like from the other side. How has the marketing uh, response changed over the time as, as the economy tries to restart? Uh, what lessons have we learned and, and what changes might we see in the B2B marketing landscape in, in both China uh, and in Europe? So uh, with me today to try and answer those questions uh, are Mike Golden and Stephen Proud from Brandigo, our partner agency in China. So uh, welcome, Mike and Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Um, perhaps you can start just by introducing yourselves uh, and a little bit of background about Brandigo as well. Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Golden. I'm the president of Brandigo, and I'm here with Stephen Proud. Hello, everyone. Uh, Brandigo is a 15-year-old uh, B2B agency uh, based here in Shanghai, which is where we're at right now. We're in our Shanghai offices, and we work with basically multinationals across a, a wide variety of marketing and communication spectrum for their amazing journeys um, here in China. So we're very happy to uh, talk with you today and let you know what's uh, happening here in, in China and to see if we can make some parallels or connections or spark some uh, interesting conversation. Stephen? Yeah, for sure. Just to echo what Mike said, very pleased to be involved. Um, as David said as well, I think it's going to be interesting to hear some of the real differences in, in everybody's experience and looking forward to the crystal ball session at the end as well. So thank you for having us. Good. And I would just say uh, before we get into it, um, we're trying to have some time for Q and A, so uh, it should be a, you should have a Q and A option. Uh, just type your questions in there as we go, and we'll try and get to them either as we go through or, or at the end. Um, so I guess just to start us off, uh, Mike and Stephen, what what uh, what's it like now? I mean, you're you're sitting in an office, which is kind of exciting for us over here. Can you just paint a bit of a picture of what what life is like in Shanghai. Is there a a shift to a new normal, or is it kind of back to the old normal? Um, I, it's kind of a combination of the two, I think. What you have to bear in mind is a lockdown in China was very much a lockdown. Um, so how it's been maybe interpreted as more relaxed in some parts of the world, I think here, um, particularly for the very first month, people hardly left their apartments. Um, Public transport was completely closed. Um, when things started to open up again, there was a lot of use of mobile technology, QR code technology to track people's movements, allow you access to buildings that you're allowed to. Shopping malls were closed. Uh, borders were closed straight away. Um, in terms of, I think, day-to-day -day life within the city is very much back to normal. Everybody's obviously wearing their face masks in public. The QR codes are still there. You have a little health status that you show on your mobile phone if you want to go into a mall or a hotel. What has carried on to be different is we're not seeing a lot of intercity activity yet. So it's very, it, it's, it's a challenge to travel between different uh, regions, different cities within China at the moment because different provinces have different restrictions and their quarantine still. Uh, and there's, there's very little, if any, international travel. The border is still closed to foreigners who weren't in the country when the 
when the uh, decision was made to close borders to all foreigners. So even if you are a valid visa holder, if you are not in China at the moment, you are not getting back into China anytime soon. Just to add on to that, I came back about five or six weeks ago and I came from the UK actually. And because of that, they put me in a home quarantine for two weeks. And it was a hard quarantine. They sent me via police escort to get tested one night in a hotel, then another police escort to our neighborhood where I was met by our neighborhood committee wearing hazmat suit, the whole gear, stayed at home. They had a police sensor on my door. And if we open the door more than once a day to, let's say, collect some takeout, the good thing was there was takeout was uh, available <laughs> and grocery <laughs> delivery. Um, so kind of once a day, we would open the door really quickly, throw out the garbage and uh, grab some takeout stuff that we had ordered. Uh, but it was a very hard, uh, like pretty hard lockdown. So, you know, that's one of the bigger differences also yeah. in that now I think there's zero or relatively low uh, number of actual cases in Shanghai. So it's uh, ironically a very safe place to be. Yeah. I think one more thing that is interesting, particularly with some of the measures that the UK for one is discussing. I mentioned the QR code that we had of our health status before. There was a lot of uh, use of data in how China and different provinces managed the crisis at the time. So for example, I had the QR code to show to get onto the subway once the subway reopened. And then there was other QR codes in each individual subway carriage. Now I would scan those when I sat down on the train. And if anybody within that subway carriage had a change in their health code status during the day, I would automatically get a push alert on my mobile phone via Alipay to tell me that somebody's health status was in has changed and they were in that carriage that you were also in at this time. So again, it, what's interesting about that is how that data was used and how comfortable people are sharing that type of data. I think that's gonna be something that's gonna be interesting in some of the Western countries that perhaps aren't used to that type of thing. It's, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it, to see how, yeah. you know, how comprehensive that, that is and how far away I think we are from that. Yeah, and it, does it feel like an invasion or is it does it feel a, a reassuring thing what's the response to it kind of culturally i think in my opinion you know uh, you know i would say chinese are willing to give up some part of their let's say liberties yeah. uh for safety and and that's a concession that they make here that maybe in the west is more difficult for us to make certainly in the u.s where i'm from yeah. it is yeah. and it just while we're on a kind of cultural change thing i think one of the things that we're thinking we might see is is um, in some culturally more conservative markets uh, that the uh, any kind of reluctance or conservatism towards digital transformation and, 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 and that kind of thing particularly has been probably washed away by this so you know we're, we're active in, in Germany and that's been a big thing in, in the mid market there what they call the middle stand has been very um, sort of slow to adopt um, digital transformation or slower than the, the government would like uh, and I think there's a feeling that now might be a real window of opportunity for technology companies particularly and services companies related to that to to target that sort of market do you, do you think that there's a similar trend in China it might be a good window of opportunity now in the next 12 18 months uh, absolutely I, I think especially you know in the b2b market here um, there's some similarities with Germany certainly um, a little bit old-fashioned uh, in terms of, not in a bad way, but, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, sales calls and um, let's say trade magazines and things like that were very important here. And now we're trying to figure out, okay, no more trade shows for the time being. Yeah. What are we going to do? And that's going to lead to very fast digital transformation. Now, a lot of the tools are already here and in place. In some ways, uh, China is already way ahead of yeah, the West with some of the tools, uh, but it's probably more on the consumer side. So, you know, adapting those tools to B2B, I think it's going to be one of the key things moving forward. Mm. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting how much of it is about uh, a mindset change as well in the, in the way that businesses um, think and operate and, and maybe the amount of uh, risk that they're prepared to take in those kind of areas. Do you think, do you think that there'll be a, a, an opening up from a business perspective? I think so. You know, we know that digital transformation, which is a big giant word, which kind of means a thousand different things. Uh, it's hard to grasp what that means and every company is going to be different. 
But I, I think, you know, they're going to be forced like everywhere else to push into this and to figure out ways, uh, you know, to get sales and marketing uh, into the hands of target audience. So I, I think this in some ways will be a very positive way to push on the B2B side. Yeah. I think, yeah, well, just to build on what Mike was saying, I think China, in my experience, has always been a very early adopter, especially in the terms of, in terms of the tech. Um, I know we'll talk a little bit about WeChat later, but kind of WeChat and how, what that meant to the digital economy in China, what Alipay has meant to the digital economy in China. Um, people are very used to the kind of digital economy channels, if you like. I think what I'm going to be interested in seeing is how, and again, from a B2B point of view, is people are used to the channel and they're used to seeing the content on the channel, but the content and the messaging has got to adapt more so than the actual platforms here in China because the platforms are already in place. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. Let's get, let's, um, I'm going to bring up the, the slides now and uh, we can get into some examples about um, how, you know, it's, it's changing specifically. Um, so, uh, yeah, do you want to just sort of, uh, I guess, paint a little bit of picture of, of the Chinese B2B marketing landscape kind of pre-COVID-19, what, what were the big trends in it? And then this, this point here about the, what's happening with the, with the paid and earned channels. Sure. So I would say a majority of the B2B landscape here um, are quite old fashioned trade magazines and they're trying to transition to social media and web um, doing kind of a mediocre job about it. So a lot of the channels are very challenging. There aren't that many great paid or earned channels uh, in China. There's a lot of them, but you know, you can see that even for the social media on the WeChat, the WeChat versions of some of the big media, for example, aren't that popular. And I think a lot of what's happening is people directly sharing content with each other um, through WeChat mostly with their own contacts. So they might see some interesting piece of content and grab it and share it with their contact. Um, so it's been very challenging for, for B2B industry, for our clients as well. And one of the things that we found is that the ones who spend the time to make great creative content um, that was educational, inspirational, interesting, fun, um, are doing much better now. And that they had all of these channels in place already, um, these content sources and channels, um, ways to build the content, uh, they're doing much better than I would say the ones who didn't do that. Um, so it goes to me back to, you know, the easy thing of like, you know, what's your content in your channel? Is, is your content great? Is it really reaching your target audience? Do people actually want to share it or are you just doing it to make content? So, you know, it's, it's nothing that's different from anywhere else in the world, I would say. But I would say the, 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 um, the contrast is very stark now of how important it is to have interesting and engaging content. So, mm. so, so the winners have, have spent a lot of time um, investing in building the audience on the channels prior to the, prior to the crisis. Yeah, and you know they were they were having trouble with WeChat, I would say, because people think that WeChat is, let's say, the the cure or the fantastic solution for all of your marketing, but it's actually tons of effort behind a good WeChat channel, and that's about the content. So setting up the channel and managing WeChat is not that complicated, but actually making engaging, fantastic content for B two B marketers is a huge challenge, and I think a lot of the the people on the call understand that. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting as well because I think uh, you know over here, well, globally with the with the fact that uh, Google's phasing out third party cookies, for example, there, there's going to be more of a, a shift and even more importance to first party data in your own website and your own channels. Um, but that you know that does require um, a long term mindset, I guess, to build the audience because. I don't know, is there a sense in China that you can that you can pay initially and buy the audience and, and then you've got the audience and then you can do, do something with it? Or is it, do you really need to put in that long-term investment and build it organically? It, it's a mix. I mean, some people literally go buy the audience, which is, you know, cheating. Um, and that doesn't help anyone, obviously. Uh, but, you know, there's a pretty bad uh, reputation of having zombie fans, which is what they're called. And, you know, you can do that in the West too, but here it was rampant at one point where you know you could see an account with a million followers and then having 20 people like 
a piece of content, which doesn't make any sense at all. So I, I think uh, now B2B marketers are saying, okay, we're, we're in it for the long haul. We need to take time to grow the fans. But that obviously takes patience. And for the marketing agency, that's a lot of pressure for us as well. Because, you know, the fans aren't coming out of nowhere. We have to, yeah. you know, push hard and, and make amazing content for them, basically. Yeah. yeah. Some people have relied on, on KOLs and influencers to do that to some extent as well. But again, there's, there's challenges with coming to that. You've got to pick the right one. There's even been some scandals about KOLs overinflating their audiences as well. Um, and not as distant future. So, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought this was uh, uh, was really interesting a graph I, uh, I came across. And just in terms of the, the content then, I guess there's a question about what sort of content have the brands been producing in China and what's been working during the crisis. Um, and we've got a couple of examples of what we've seen over here. But I thought this was really interesting. This was a survey from Edelman um, by a statista that, that asked about um, the number of consumers who convinced others to stop using a brand, so they not just themselves, but gone and actually convinced someone else to stop using a brand because of its inappropriate response to the coronavirus pandemic. And it was, I thought, astonishingly high in China. I don't know if that if that uh, surprises you. Or is is that something to do with the, the culture there, or or is it uh, because I, I thought it's only seven percent of the Right. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I saw this line and I thought of like, sure, of consumers in China who convince someone to stop using a brand due to whatever, you know, is kind of the China story. It happens all the time here. Yeah. It's the, the, um, the China as a, as a culture is very good of whipping up support for its own industries when it needs to. And if it can be seen that a like a homegrown organization can benefit from an international organization that has made a misstep, it, it's very much amplified in this part of the world. I think that's quite a diplomatic way of trying yeah, to put it. You know, there, you know, there's a lot of sensitivity, especially, you know, with the internet, yeah. people that are, um, if they see something that's maybe regarded as anti-Chinese, um, you know, they will, just engage millions of people to like destroy that brand online, you know, with a lot of the fashion brands like D and G had this happen when they made, you know, a very stupid kind of advertisement that Chinese saw as degrading uh, or looking down on them. Uh, then, you know, this brand just got destroyed here. Yeah. So online and offline. So, you know, I, I think it's part of that. And you can see that now a uh, pretty strong rise in, in nationalism, I would say, um, especially with a lot of the anti-China rhetoric coming out of the U.S. and yeah. some other countries. So there's a there's a phrase that it, it's kind of in its infancy. Um, I've seen it discussed, but I haven't really seen examples of it yet, particularly in B2B. But we are seeing the refrend, the phrase "revenge purchasing" flowing around in certain parts of the media as well. In that consumers, buyers are making a conscious decision to avoid a purchase from a certain organization from a certain part of the world. Like I said, I haven't seen a, a case study of that yet, but it's definitely a phrase that's, that's doing the rounds. Yeah. It's, and it's a, it's a really interesting marketing challenge, isn't it? I think um, there's kind of two responses uh, in Europe. I think that we, we've seen and in the U S uh, uh, one is just to, to, to stop communications and to kind of go dark and really keep it to a minimum or try to avoid mentioning the crisis. Um, there were certainly a few companies that basically put a blanket ban on social media for a, for a period during the early days of the crisis. Uh, the other is to be to try and kind of embrace it and, and turn to this more helpful, um, provide some utility. And that's certainly what... Um, what we think, I think, is, is, has worked on this side. What's been the response from brands in China? It's interesting, David. I, th I think, you know, in the beginning, it was during Chinese New Year when this, yeah. everything started to hit. And then that's a slow time anyway. No one's working. And then people realizing what was happening, I, I think, took weeks, actually. So I think most of the brands here were pretty slow to respond. But then they started to catch up. And they did so with very positive, yeah. you know, reinforcing, inspiring type of messages, yeah. um, contributions, yes. helping. I, I, saw, I saw a lot of, you know, once some of the organizations started kicking in money, 
at organizations, um, you know, for charities or for health organizations, that started to really steamroll and, and take a life of its own. So, um, and definitely, you know, like I mentioned before, the positive China um, kind of rhetoric also started. Yeah. So a lot of homegrown uh, response and supporting uh, homegrown brands as well was a big thing during the crisis. So I, I saw that a lot of the brands uh, and the key opinion leaders were starting to sell Wuhan goods and things coming out of Wuhan to support Wuhan and then contrib contributing all of that money back to Wuhan. So, you know, there's very positive yeah. kind of response in, in that way. The mayor of Wuhan himself was doing live streaming broadcasts with influencers via social media platforms where he was selling Wuhan products to all kinds. It was, it, the actual, it was fascinating to kind of watch him with, with these sort of glamorous influencers. And there's the mayor in his suit with his party pin. And he is he's like, a, like a QVC host almost pushing <laughs> Just wanted to add on something that Mike said as well about the, the, the contribution point that you made. I think that was vital. And I think a lot of the, what we saw from the, some of the more international brands that have done well, that contribution, yes, it was financial as well, but some of the messaging around being seen to be part of the community and being seen to be, we're all in this together, we're in this with you, kind of ties with that contribution as well. Brands that managed to, to kind of shift their messaging towards that very quickly. So they, they didn't go dark. They showed how they were like part of the, this with everybody else in the trenches, if you like, with everybody else. That's been a particularly strong messaging coming out of it too. Yeah, that's, that, that's really interesting. I think the, um, you know, I don't know if you have the phrase, uh, do you have the phrase thought leadership in, in China? Does that, that translate? Yeah, because um, sure. yeah. uh, I, I sort of one of the things that's quite a personal view that I've I've actually enjoyed through this process, and I hope we retain is is the fact that a lot of the communications have become, as it says here, more immediate, more real. There's a, a, a much more of a sort of down to earth element to it, and I think we have started to put aside this concept of thought leadership a little bit, and this which feels now a little bit pompous really to to say right we're you know we're going to stand up here and tell everyone how to think uh and instead we've replaced it with much more look here's stuff we're actually doing to help people yeah. here's how we're going about stuff here and um you know the best sort of content is news if you can create news like the, the service now example here where they you know very quickly released four of their apps free to the community and, and, and that's news and that gets some loads of coverage and i you know i'm hopeful that that that's something that uh that we can that we can hold on to i don't know if it if, it, if it's a, a similar thing in china do you, do you feel like there's a or has it always been like a little bit less um a bit more down to earth there i i think so i think in china though you'll get a lot more kind of rah rah rhetoric yeah as well um but you know i think the the ones that do break through all the clutter will be the ones that are offering something practical or pragmatic and you know, useful for their their customers or their target audience. So I, I agree with that completely. Okay, so I guess starting to to look towards what we think might change. Uh, on, no, we've got we've got this. Uh, this is a great example. So uh, I think one of my uh, personal uh, ambitions in in, uh, in my marketing career is to create a B two B marketing game at some point. Not necessarily for any grand marketing. Because I think it would be a great piece of marketing, just because it would be really fun to do. And I think you've you've done something or something close to that here. And I think there's just this idea about how we engage customers who are, you know, the, as as the face to face channel declines or, or stays inactive for a while, how are we actually going to keep attention and engage customers? And this is this is a great little mm -hmm. example. Do you want to talk us through what you've done? Sure. So this is for National Instruments. It's a semiconductor testing company um, coming out of the U.S., but with a, they have a strong office here in China. And when we looked at, at this customer, what they were looking at, um, you know, they're really targeting these kind of semiconductor testing uh, kind of guys who are, love being uh, kind of geeky and in the office. You know, they're very scientific. They're engineers and scientists. Um, so we tried to find some type of interesting content that would, cut through a bit and for this particular one we we made a quiz that was online 
And the quiz basically uh, asks them a series of extremely technical questions. And, uh, you know, we had to put together the quiz, which actually, you know, for marketing people, it's a bit challenging, I'll be honest. We're not the smartest with the science and the math. Um, but uh, we did our best and they corrected it all. Uh, but we ended up with a, a really nice online quiz. Um, it was all kind of mobile optimized or H5 is what they call it here. So people could pass it to their friends via WeChat. And, um, and basically they would take the quiz, get a score, they can share the score with their friends and, and compare. And at the end, there's a, a lucky draw winner. And lucky draws, you know, someone, the top scores get to win some prizes, which is a very, very common kind of uh, tactic here in China. So it was a combination of, I would say, like interesting insight combined with a fun, creative approach um, and then finding the right channels to reach that target audience. Um, One of the quirks that we found in the research when we were putting the, the campaign together was just how competitive these guys were. So it's a very niche market, as Mike said. I think it was maybe 400, 500 total who were in that industry who we were, we were aiming for, but we, like I said, the research showed that they were super competitive and that helped with the engagement and helped with them sharing the content really. Yeah, it's a great, great example. I think that, that, uh, the whole sort of, you know, um, mobile channel, uh, we come back to that, the, the, just while we're talking about the mobile channel, I think it, it, yeah, it'd be good to just kind of explain just how kind of, um, ubiquitous WeChat is and, and how how that's used there because I think it might you know question but it might show how the social platforms are going to evolve in Europe and North America and there might be some some ideas there for for marketers here about what to do as early adopters mm -hmm. well I one of the things when, when we talk to some of our partners overseas they've always got a kind of a, an interpretation of what they think WeChat is so, and quite often they will try and equate it to what are the social channels that they're familiar with. But we, we have to sort of say that it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't necessarily work like that. I, I sometimes use the phrase, it's, it's like a Swiss army knife of apps, if you like. So I think if, you, if, you, if I give you an example of a typical day for myself, I will get up in the morning, maybe check some news, maybe pay to top up my mobile phone credit, and then once I've had my breakfast, I'll leave, I'll unlock a shared bike to make the cycle to the subway station. I'll pay for my ticket on the subway. I will take the subway, catch up with some news, catch up with some messaging with some friends, maybe do a bit of work, reach out some contacts that I have to. Before I get off the subway, I'll order my coffee so I can pick it up from the coffee shop before I get it to my building. And then I'll have a quick catch up with Mike because we need to jump on something straight away when we get to the office. I have not left the WeChat app to do all of that. I have done all of that within the WeChat ecosystem, if you like. So it, it's so much more, I think, that's the best way that I can use to describe what WeChat is. It's actually, when we say it's ubiquitous, it, it, it really, really is for all aspects of, of people's life, I guess, in China. Would you agree, Mike? Uh, absolutely, and I think for, for B2B marketers, so you can have an official account, which is kind of like a website and some other stuff. You can have, a mini app, which is basically an application that you can program and have it sitting inside WeChat. So you don't need to download an external application. Um, this could be a shopping site. This could be um, some type of um, document storage site for your target, for your clients, things like that. So there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do. And I would say in China, most of the B2B organizations here have gotten through kind of, let's say stage one of their official account, which is content creation, and sending content to followers. This is the, the easy thing to do. Now I think we're moving into stage two and I think because of COVID, you know, people are going faster towards that and they're saying, how else can we use these? Our followers, they're all there. How can we make it more useful for them? So if you're looking at like a customer journey, you know, can we do more on that loyalty side of the customer journey? Can we develop some apps within WeChat that can engage with them. So I, I think those are some of the things that we're talking with our clients about right now. And it's, it's super, super interesting uh, to go beyond just the content part, but to get into, you know, what else can we do? Let's just, you know, brainstorm. What else would help your client? What would help, uh, you know, your target audience be interested in you uh, in more kind of engaging ways? Because WeChat's really, really flexible around that. 
it's not easy though. You know, that first stage of content marketing is hard because to get the followers, you have to kind of stick the content in their face or have them scan a QR code. And that would take place at a trade show or when you meet someone. That's not happening now, obviously. So to build fans has been very slow to go organically. So, you know, there's, there's challenges with WeChat. So if you go into it saying, I'm going to create a WeChat channel and I'm going to have a million fans and followers, it's going to be great. You know, it's, it's not that easy. You need to have a great plan, a great strategy and stick it out. So, uh, but I think, you know, going into the stage two or even stage three of WeChat uh, is where we're looking at for the rest of this year, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think the way you described it, Stephen, where is this sort of seamlessly part of your life and you can see how that works and it, sound, it sounds great. And I, I guess the question is, can businesses, you know, can, can the boundaries blur so that you, you've got that permission in a way to be part of the part of the life? It's not an easy thing to get around, that, is it? But, but fascinating challenge to try, I think. So it would be interesting to see what, what sort of innovations come out there. What, is there any advice that you think would be, you know, it, if we accept that the, there might be more consolidation like that in mobile ch channels going forward in, in Europe and North America. Is there a, advice that you give to marketers now in, in those early stages? That's a great question. I think Mike sort of mentioned that it's very much a long game. Um, it's, it's not going to have sort of the immediate impact that perhaps some of the other social channels have had. Um, as with those social channels though, content is, is key, the shareability of the content, producing something that somebody is going to want to take the time to pass on to their friend or their colleague or their acquaintance. That is how you are ultimately going to grow your followers and, and that takes a commitment. Yeah, and just to put onto that, you know, don't, don't, don't be afraid to, you know, make something amazing. Yeah. Right. I mean, make some amazing content, you know, you don't have to put out press releases into no. your social media, you know, that has a place certainly, but you know, push it out, do something interesting. You know, I think some of our clients, you know, everyone's a little bit hesitant to do, to, you know, get out there and really make something cool. And I think this is the time to do it, to be honest. Good. There's a, there's a question from the audience yeah, from Paul. Um, so could you go a bit more into the lucky draw concept, um, which I know is one of the ways that people buy an audience in China. What kind of value prize is seen as worthwhile for a senior target audience? Does everyone win something or are you just entered into a random draw? When, when you go to a wedding here or when you go to a company party, at the end, there's a lucky draw always. Just to let you know how... Uh, how standard it is. So, you know, everyone came to the company party. Now we're gonna have a lucky draw. You get a PS4 and you get a box I've, of I've uh, had, chocolate. I've had washing up liquid in a lucky draw. I, I won, and, but I got to break a big golden egg with a mallet. So, win-win. <laughs> so, you know, some of our clients think, hey, you know, we're a serious organization. We make, you know, parts for the auto value chain. This is ridiculous. But then after working WeChat for about six months or having their local marketing team, they give up and they say, okay, let's do a lucky draw. <laughs> so, you know, it might be something within WeChat, a, a very standard example that you'll see is, okay, um, you know, based on this article, uh, leave a comment below and, the, and then you can vote on the comment. So the most upvoted comment, we're going to send the prize to, something like that. So trying to make things a little bit gamified and engaging like that is very standard in China. And it's also, people feel it's more fun. If it doesn't have that element, it's kind of boring, is the sense that, that I get. And it, it, just to answer the Paul's question about the value, I don't think it has to be a, you know, a, something which has a physical value that has to be particularly high. If, it, if the value matches the campaign, it, it may be, you know, the time that you want them to engage with your content. It could be something that's just like a, a, a Starbucks voucher or a looking coffee voucher for you know, a week's worth of lattes on their way to work and things like that. So, so small value can still, you know, can still, I'm trying to stop the word using the value, small value can still add value to the campaign. Yeah, that's right. It's a competitive streak perhaps again. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, the other, I think, channel that's, that's uh, that is interesting one in, in in both. I think this is this is one I think will develop 
uh, a lot more in the next couple of years in 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 Europe and North America for the B two B as well. But this, it's it's this influence to channel. It's, it's very big on the consumer side in, in China. Is that right? And, and, and brands waking up to it. Or they they what, what, where are they in the journey in China? I, I think you know they call them KOL or key opinion leader. Sometimes key opinion influencer. Um, and then key opinion consumer is another type, yeah. but um, some of the, the channels for paid advertising, um, like for example, we've got LinkedIn, right? And it's easy, or Facebook, um, it's easy to kind of target someone pretty effectively on that. Um, but here on Weibo or on WeChat, it's quite expensive and you can't target very well, um, especially for B2B audiences, it's very hard to target. So people have shifted to using these key opinion leaders as the route. And, you know, these are people who are, they might be a brand ambassador or they might just be someone who will do one tweet for your brand and you pay for it. And they've reached, you know, a million people with their audience. Um, so for consumers and especially during COVID, it has gone through the roof, yeah. absolutely gone through the roof as like the main way to promote stuff. And for B2B side, it's still early. You know, people want to have that. And we have some that are kind of okay, depending on the industry. You know, if you're in airline or aviation, you might have someone who's related and has a lot of followers, but it's kind of hard to get them to monetize mm -hmm. and, and to get them to help you. So it's something that, you know, B2B marketers here really want to develop and have. It's not quite there yet, but certainly the consumer side is developed extremely fast on this and it's made a huge impact on Chinese society even I would say yeah I think we've seen maybe we've seen some smart stuff here perhaps on a kind of b2c to b point of view so you're seeing b2b companies use the inf um, use influencers to create a pull factor with the with the, the customers that they're trying to reach out to I think we saw some smart use of that in some of the F&B sector work that we were doing and others were doing um, over the, well, before the crisis stuck. So um, yeah, as Mike says, it, it's very much evolving from a B2B point of view, but it's huge from a B2C perspective and we're seeing some B2C to B and the mayor of Wuhan. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> yeah. used to, uh, yeah. And he's very good. We're trying to get him. Very good. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we've used uh, key opinion leaders for, let's say, food ingredients like omega-3 supplements that go into other foods as a supplement or as a, an additive. Um, and we've successfully used, let's say, moms who push that. And that helps support the brand and their marketing push with the, their B2B customers. So, you know, there's ways for B2B marketers to do it depending on the industry. Yeah, I think that B to C to B channel is, is a really interesting one. And I think the, the reason I think that, that the influencer channel, um, although it's got a slightly sort of dubious reputation because of fake uh, followers and so on, I think the, the reality is that the trust and opinion is, is formed by individuals. You know, if you, if, certainly if I look at the people who I look to from a marketing point of view, there are individuals and they, they work for a certain brand and there's a halo effect on that brand, but I don't really care what the brand thinks. It's the individuals that I'm interested in. And I think it, it gives an opportunity. For, there's a lot of brands, particularly technology brands, you know, who are maybe in some of the more traditional areas, more long established industries who are trying to reestablish themselves, reinvent themselves. Um, and the you know it's much easier to have a, a you know a voice and opinion and a respectable position on a new topic if for an individual than it is to reshift the whole brand now. so I think pushing individuals who are both outside and inside the company sort of influencers who are, who are inside the company key executives who you can push to become opinion leaders is, is another way I think it might uh, evolve and, and, and start getting picked up so good I think um, uh, the, 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 this last point, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but the, the, one of the things that we see happening is that the buyer experiences we think will will change, will get will get harder uh, as there's more and more scrutiny on. You know, it's, it, this is the garden of view of it's already complex and convoluted, particularly in, a, in any B two B decision that's reasonably high value. Um, but I think there's going to be more risk aversion. 
um, more decision makers involved, it's going to be even harder to navigate. Do you think there will be a similar trend in China? How, how does that buyer experience work? Is it is it um, is it very consensual? Is it very hierarchical? I think it's going to be similar. It is very hierarchical, um, but you're also have very complicated um, channels like this to reach the different people that are involved in the purchase process. So uh, I think it, it's also going to get more complicated here. Um, and especially in the absence of trade shows this year, um, very complicated to kind of get people, um, you know, into webinars as opposed to an in-person seminar, things like that. Um, it's, it's going to be an interesting time. And I think it's the time to try to think, of, you know, fresh ideas, fresh digital ideas with people. So, yeah, I mean, Mike mentioned trade shows just then. All the trade shows are moving online. So we've, we've, even, we've got the Canton Fair, which is one of the biggest trade shows in the world, which was a huge priority for the B2B firms within this region. It's going to be completely online now. And seeing how that pans out and what that means for the buyer journey is going to be fascinating. And how we can react to that is going to be the challenge. Yeah, great. So just to... Um, uh, uh, to leave something for people to, to take away and finish with these, these are the five uh, five themes that we've picked out as things that we think will be good questions for B2B marketers to be asking themselves in, in the post-corona era. So we talked about that buyer enablement just now. The distinctiveness, we've talked talk, talked around that subject without talking directly at it. How will you, how will you stand out uh, as the competition for audience intensifies? I think this idea that there'll be different areas of growth, different industries, will experience rapid growth as digital transformation accelerates and, and how do you find the best customers um, segmentation and targeting will be a big focus we've talked about the consumer channels and this idea of accelerated digital transformation so um we've got a couple of minutes left I'll just see if there's any questions uh from the audience or i'll, I'll ask you to finish with one piece of advice So what would uh, just to, to finish this off then, Mike Stephen? What would what if you were um, if you were to give one piece of advice to marketers looking forward to the career? Perhaps what what are you most looking what are you most looking forward to personally? What 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 is exciting you about the next stage for B two B marketers? I, I think um, this is going to push B two B marketers here certainly into a, a new kind of era of digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's gonna really push forward, you know, parts that have been a bit lapsed here, like uh, marketing automation and things like that. Probably the UK is farther ahead of, than here, combined with the modern tools that we have and combining it with WeChat and other things and maybe going beyond that. So I'm looking forward to see what that's gonna look like or if we can help develop that. Cause I think it's, it's gonna be wide open now. Stephen? Um, I, I, similar, I guess. One of the things that I found really interesting before the, the virus hit was how, um, because China had been such an early adopter with a lot of the e-commerce channels and platforms, brands were actually rushing for a, an, offline to on, an online to offline perspective to create brand experiences as part of their differentiation. And overnight, all of that was swept away as as uh, as a tool for them to use so i you know people are still going to be picking up what's going to replace that i think is going to be interesting we mentioned about the trade fairs and things like that that avenue to differentiation has been completely closed off almost overnight um so how again and it, it, it links back to what mike said it's that it's the digital experience that brands are going to have to create now and rely on for their own differentiation in the market it's going to be really interesting yeah yeah, and certainly turmoil and change creates loads of interesting challenges for marketers. So, uh, from a work perspective, at least there's, there's some good things to get our teeth stuck into. So, I think it's been really fascinating. Thank you both very much for your time. Just to say for everyone that the recording will be available afterwards. We'll make sure it's on our homeschooling for marketers page uh, and shared with everyone. Um, shared with everyone here. So. Um, the next in our series of webinars is uh, on the 21st, which will be about targeting systems integrators. 
Um, <clears throat> so yeah, thanks again, uh, Mike, Stephen. Really enjoyed the chat. Thanks for your time, uh, and uh, yeah, good luck with uh, in your next lucky draw. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for having us. Thanks, David. Thanks, Cheers. everyone. Bye bye.